Hello, my name is Brian Malone. That's me and my brother Dan more than 40 years ago. And this is Castle Rock at about the same time. It's the town where I grew up. The county seat of Douglas County, Colorado. When I was a kid, Castle Rock wasn't much more than a place to stop for gas between Denver and Colorado Springs. One of the best things about Douglas County was its public schools. For at least the past generation, Douglas County has been one of the best, if not the best, school district in the state. Our schools have always attracted the best teachers. The great public school system was one of the main reasons why I ended up moving back here after I got married and had my own kids. And now, my own children go to the same schools as I did. Since then, Douglas County has grown up from a little ranch community to one of the wealthiest places in America. Still, through all that growth and change, the schools have remained excellent. But lately, I've been noticing some big changes in how our schools are being run. Teachers are talking under their breath about being intimidated, being afraid for their jobs, to the point where they're afraid to show their faces. It's a culture of fear. Fear is everywhere. It's hostile. There's a lot of distrust. Just beating down their scare tactics to silence people is, um, it's, it's incredible. It's incredulous. I should have been paying better attention, but I've been busy and never gave it much thought. I knew our schools were excellent, and they were on autopilot. Honestly, the entire time I've lived here, I'd never been to a school board meeting, and I never even voted in the school board election. But now, things around here are getting hard to ignore. And since whatever began to change, parents have been taking over the school administration building. And a record number of teachers are now leaving. Dozens of teachers leaving each Douglas County school. Then you talk with district officials who say things are better than ever. What's happening? I'm no education expert, and I don't pretend to know how to run a public school system. But just look around. As a parent with two kids in public schools, I have some questions. It's election night, 
a night that's been coming for a long time. A new school board is up for the vote. And for what's often an overlooked, uninteresting, and low turnout election, tonight is different. These people are my neighbors and my friends. They've been pushing back against a free market conservative school board. They're trying to roll back free market education reforms that have split our community in half. On the other side of this election, a handful of some very wealthy people and their organizations have spent a lot of money to keep these local citizens from running their own school district. In fact, they've outspent these citizens about 10 to 1. In all, more than a million dollars has been spent on this local school board election. It's a cash bar, so pay your bar bill because the campaign has no money. The majority of that million dollars has come from a small handful of billionaires and millionaires outside of Douglas County. Like Jeb Bush, the Koch brothers, Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire who founded J.D. Edwards, an oil and gas magnet, and a commercial real estate developer. These guys don't live here, and they don't have kids in our public schools. So why are they pouring all of this money into a local school board election? This might have something to do with it. The annual budget of Douglas County Schools hovers somewhere around the half a billion dollar mark. That half a billion is for the most part replenished by the taxes we all pay every year. And so far, that money has been off limits to the private sector because it's been set aside to educate the kids of public schools in Douglas County. But what if all that money could be freed up to the marketplace so that investors, hedge fund managers, and other entrepreneurs could tap into what's considered a sacred cow? That would be a pretty safe investment, knowing that that $500 million would be replenished every year by you and me, the taxpayer. Why would I want to add charter schools into my portfolio? Well, I think it's, it's a very stable business, very recession resistant. It's a very, um, it's a, it's a high demand product. There's uh, 400,000 kids in waiting lists for charter schools. They're opening, growing the industry's growing about 12 to 14 percent a year. Some people think running public schools like a business is just fine. These free market thinkers think public education in America is broken. And they've got a strong narrative against public schools, teachers, and unions. This highly coordinated effort, largely outside the public view, aims to turn public education over to free market and private business. They use politics and marketing, backed by a lot of outside money, to turn over these local communities. Here's how it started in my hometown. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. The financial crisis of 2009 came right to the front door of Douglas County Schools. Reserves dried up, which were followed by dramatic budget cuts, which meant the end of many classes and programs. Teachers had to take what would become a four-year pay freeze. For many, the school district needed some changes, some smart business sense to get us back on track. So, in the past two election cycles, a self-described free market school board got elected into office by a small minority of residents who showed up to vote. I hate to admit it, but I was part of the majority that didn't show up. Their reforms center around choice, where free market competition between schools is considered healthy, and parents get to choose their education for their children the same way one might choose a new car. We simply prefer um, some attention to scarcity and demand as being determinants of compensation. And oh, by the way, that's what's true in the rest of the American economy. Why should it be any different here? The board's first order of business was to find a new superintendent to carry out its agenda. The board recruited Dr. Elizabeth Fagan, a guest speaker for the free market Milton Friedman Foundation. It was about the same time she started that teachers started leaving. Some people like their ideas. I support our school board. I support reform, and I support every teacher out there, but I do not support what the union is doing here tonight. Others see ulterior motives. We believe the district leadership and the board of education members distort messages to a alarming degree 
which borders on knowingly misleading the public it was elected to serve. I cannot embrace corporate education reform. Our children deserve so much more. Thank you. It's a very libertarian philosophy that says, let the market rule. And to me, what is, what's amazing is that there are, in fact, conservative Republicans, and I meet them, who say, um, I'm a conservative. I don't want to tear down public education. Public, the public school in my community is the heart of the community. As a conservative, why would I want to tear down my own community? I always think back to a great book, actually, uh, David Berliner. And Berliner and Bert Biddle wrote this book called The Manufactured Crisis, where they actually take you through how all of that data was used to spin in a certain direction to paint the picture that schools were failing. But to suggest that the system is failing such that we need to wholly uh, drop it or transform it into or a private it or to give it up on it, right? Is um, I think not supported by uh, any sort of, of credible research. This idea that that's propagated in the media and with policymakers in terms of public education is in a crisis or or is failing. Once again, uh, that's been around for a long time since Sputnik, but it, it really started to take off in the 1980s after the release of A Nation at Risk. A Nation at Risk was a report commissioned in 1981. The report indicted the American public education system, claiming that we were on a steep downhill slide and that future generations would pay the price. A Nation at Risk set the stage for what the authors of the report saw as much needed reforms. The math and science and engineering scores of American students are among the lowest in the industrialized world now. Reforms now use careful marketing language with sophisticated sounding words and catchphrases. We are committed to a world-class education. As we look at world-class education targets, I am so passionate about getting education right. Why does a public school district need to advertise? And I know that they're depending on us. Well, we have some extraordinary teachers in Douglas County. This is a form of image marketing. It's the same kind of strategy used by big corporations who've gotten bad press. BP has paid over $23 billion to help people and businesses who were affected and to cover cleanup costs. These kinds of commercials are used to make us all feel better about them. Superintendent Elizabeth Fagan advertises Douglas County Schools as an excellent district with its eye on the future. We have just an amazing opportunity in Douglas County because of the quality of our teachers. The emphasis on, on education and kids. But ask the teachers and they'll paint you a different picture. Shifted from doing what's right for politics. Just the feeling of that I can't do enough or that I'm, it's sort of being watched by Big Brother. That's the type of feeling that I've had that really negatively impacts my ability to do my job. One thing that's certain in Douglas County, there are a lot of teachers that feel intimidated. The 30 plus teachers I interview all ask that their identities be hidden. You're okay. Mm -hmm. you're Except for one. I, you're, you're starting to worry me. <laughs> Brian White is a Gulf War vet, a parent with kids in Douglas County Schools, and a high school teacher. You're not afraid to show your identity? No, no, I'm not. Why not? Um, because I think the truth needs to be told, and, and, and I want people to see me telling the truth about what's going on. You know, I, I know that the teachers in this district, myself, the teachers that I work with, work very, very hard to make sure that the kids in this district don't aren't feeling the effects of what's going on. But, but some of it is, I think, inevitable. Because the climate created by the board and central administration sucks the life out of teaching. At any given school board meeting, you're likely to see Brian White at the podium. He's one of the few teachers who's not afraid to face off with the school board. The corporate reform model is destined to fail. You're not afraid that this district might come after you at all? This, this board, this superintendent? Uh, they may. Um, and if they do, we'll just take that when it comes. I, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's obviously something that, that I've considered. And, uh, if that happens, we'll, we'll, we'll just have to take it from there. I, you know, but I, I have two kids in the school district also. And, um, I am, am doing everything I can to fight for what's right for them and also for the students that I teach. I said at a DNC meeting and launched you. Teachers aren't the only ones upset at the district. One of the hot buttons is the controversial voucher program. Vouchers take public money away from public schools 
and give it to private schools. It's an idea that's been around since No Child Left Behind. Vouchers were presented as a way to give low-income parents whose children were in failing schools a way out to private schools. Many of those private schools happen to be religious schools. Parents must be given real options in the face of failure in order to make sure reform uh, is meaningful. And, and so because that crossed the line between separation of church and state, vouchers were dropped from the final version of No Child Left Behind. But in Douglas County, vouchers have been reborn with the Choice Scholarship Program. Choice used to mean all of the schools, public schools that we have in Douglas County. Neighborhood schools, charter schools, online, alternative. We had a vast array of choice. The definition of that word has changed. Choice now means voucher. Meet Cindy Barnard. She's a longtime school district volunteer and for years has helped the district with budgets and planning. She's also the co-founder of Taxpayers for Public Education. Cindy's well known for her eye to detail. And there were details about the voucher program that weren't adding up. A lot of missing information from public documents. So they developed this under the framework of a charter to count students. We connected the dots. She discovered the district had set up a dummy charter school. Choice Scholarship Charter School. Mm -hmm. Now this charter school was designed as the mechanism to fund children and basically launder the state funds earmarked for public education, laundered through this charter school to hand to private organizations. There were no students, there were no walls, there were no books, there were no teachers. This was simply a mechanism to take public tax dollars, hand it over to private schools. Parents who wanted a voucher for their child would simply sign up for this dummy charter school. Then the district wrote a check to the parent for the amount of the voucher, but the check did not get mailed directly to the parent. Instead, the district sent the check directly to the private school, and the parent actually never saw the money until they showed up to endorse this check over to the private school. So taxpayers for public education sued the school district. In order for vouchers to take a hold in the first place, they had to have done a lot of groundwork. Douglas County is far from a failing urban school district, and no one ever gave vouchers any thought at all. So they had to sell it with a lot of outside money. Money that was spent to sway voters, to win elections, and then sell the idea of vouchers to the public. I am so passionate. That feel-good television commercial, it was bought and paid for with $150,000 from the Daniels Fund, a nonprofit that supports free market education reforms. And during those past election cycles, most of the money spent came from two wealthy businessmen who had a stake in seeing vouchers succeed, Ed McVaney and Ralph Nagel. Nagel, a commercial real estate investor, had been an outspoken voice for pushing for the privatization of public schools. Nagel is a major donor for the Alliance for School Choice, a pro-reform lobby group based in Washington, D.C. Ed McVaney is the co-founder and former CEO of J.E. Edwards. He's credited with being one of the wealthiest men in America. After selling off J.D. Edwards, McVaney's attention turned to Douglas County, where he helped to create Valor Christian High School, a $93 million private religious school with current annual tuition of $16,000 per student, plus fees. With the new voucher program in place, Valor Christian would stand to benefit greatly from the redirected tax dollars for vouchers. And it did. Before the courts put a stop to it, Valor Christian received more public tax dollars from vouchers than any other private school in Douglas County. Back in 2011, McVaney and Nagel combined contributed $60,000 to the local school board election. Defending its position on vouchers has cost the district a lot of money. Using taxpayer money to fight the case would be an ethical breach for the board. But it's an expensive case to defend. So the board has called in favors from some of its free market friends. Not from Douglas County residents, but from well-known reform agenda supporters. Like the Walton Family Foundation of Walmart fame. The Daniels Fund again chipping in over a half a million dollars. 
and Alex Cranberg, an oil and gas executive who founded the Alliance for Choice and donated $50,000 for the legal defense of vouchers. We have uh, Senator Barnard. But despite all of those donations, Cindy Barnard discovered that the school board had been using our public money to fight for vouchers in court. The result? $127,368. These are state and local tax dollars earmarked for the public education of our kids that are being spent elsewhere. Well, I'd just like the record to show that you are the cause of those legal expenditures. Are you seriously suggesting you sue, you sue this school district and then you complain that we have to raise private funds to defend the decisions of a democratically elected board? Mr. Carson, I'll You are the cause of those expenditures. Mr. Carson. You are the cause. You are the cause of those expenditures. Let Period. Let me remind and we will you. defend the actions of a democratically elected board through private donations. I do not want district funds spent on a program that as of today has been found to, to be illegal and unconstitutional. But it Mr. Benvento, the Colorado no, Constitution was modeled after the Chicago's yeah. Constitution, which was written 35 years the before the Blaine, so-called Blaine Amendments. I, sit down, Ms. Blaine. Not a few shouted comments from the audience. I don't know if we have the sheriff around, but if that continues. You may come up here and speak. You bullied people? That is what you have been doing, and you expect the teachers and students to respect you. That is not okay. That is not acceptable in the least. You disgust me. You are the problem here, not the solution. Democracy does not exist. We have a board that not only ignores student results, they ignore parents, they ignore teachers. Our voices have been completely cut off. Yeah, I wish people would wake up and get their heads out of the sand. It's no surprise that Cindy and others who have been asking too many questions are being shut down by the school board, while supporters get all the time they want at the podium. Well, I'm here to remind you and thank you um, for allowing politics to be part of what you do in this district. And they do have supporters, but no one's talking. I asked this lawmaker for an interview, but he didn't return my emails or my calls. No members of the school board, not Superintendent Fagan, not anyone on her staff, not anyone in support of reforms would agree to be interviewed on camera. And the district now pays for an armed security guard for Superintendent Fagan wherever she goes in public. Dr. Fagan, how did the meeting go? Do you have a couple of words? You know, at this point, we're not ready to schedule any interviews. I just, I don't feel like it's, it's the right approach for me to take to participate. It's just so ambiguous for that. It's not just me. Now it's becoming more and more difficult for anyone to communicate with the school board. We have given our lives to teaching. The two-minute time limit for public comment is strongly enforced by the bell. We all know that. Raising the exceeding limits. It's becoming more and more difficult to attend public meetings. Almost half the time, this school board meets behind closed doors. Right now, does that bring cooperation? I understand. I understand. Yeah, I understand. I'm just doing my job. I'll get you whatever answers you need. All right? And I'll, you know, I'll help you out as best I can. Okay? Thank you, sir. Just have you just stand back on the meeting. And now they've made it more difficult to cover public meetings. Without warning, the district changed their media policy, confining reporters and cameras toward the back of the room where we can only see the backs of people's heads and can't hear them speak. If you remain behind the line, you can stay. But if you cross the line, I uh, choose to go to the meeting my public way. And so, uh, Adam 24, can I get a second unit to the school board meeting? We have a subject creating disruption, being asked to leave, refusing to do so. I've said this before. It's reasonable for any parent to want to know what's behind these reforms and why they're causing so much turmoil. What is unreasonable is being stonewalled to the point where instead of getting answers, break down the equipment. 
I'm escorted out of a public meeting surrounded by police and then banned from all school property. I work because I love what I do and I don't want to lose my job and lose this year with those students. And it kills me that these board members can do this and there's no check and balance, there's no nothing to prevent them from doing things that are not in anyone's best interest but their political agenda. And it makes me feel powerless. A parent uh, is a customer in that they pay taxes and they should be able to take their tax dollar to a school that best fits their child's needs. Finally, after several requests, I did find a free market supporter who would talk. This is former Colorado State Senator Nancy Spence. You know, I, I think that as schools are doing a good job, they're going to be able to retain those kids and the kids won't be leaving. Uh, I support charter schools and the fact that some some parents take their kid and the dollars go right out of the local school into the charter school. I get that, but schools have the ability to adjust their budgets to, to, to make accommodations for that. Um, and if they don't want to and they can't do it, they better do a better job to make um, a parent to make sure the parents are pleased with their product, with what's happening in that school. Or parents will take their money and go to a private school. Maybe a parent values a religious education um, more than they value a higher academic education at their neighborhood school. I don't know. It's a parent's choice whether they want to put their kid in a, in a private school or not. When it has to do with a parent's child, um, I think the parent ultimately ought to be able to make the decision about where their child's going to be educated and how they're going to be educated. And this is a manifestation of another thing you see at the very high end of society where people stop worrying about sanitation and police because they live in enclaves with gates and they hire a private police force and private sanitation workers. So, you know, I don't care about the quality of public services in the city of Denver. What I care about is the quality of public services in my uh, gated community. And I'll pay for that. And not a dime of my money is going to go to take care of people where I don't benefit. This is unlike what any reform was in the past. In the past, when people wanted to reform public schools, they wanted to make them better. They wanted to have higher curriculum standards. They wanted to have better trained teachers. They wanted to end segregation. They wanted more resources. They wanted equitable resources. I mean, there, were, there were always some causes that brought people together to say, we need to improve and reform and fix our public schools. They're not good enough. We want them better. That was reform. What we have today is a group of people who have cleverly massaged the language to call themselves reformers when in fact they are destroyers. The goal is to have parents want to take their kids, this is an affluent area, out of our neighborhood schools into something different. And in order to make them want to do this, they have to degrade our neighborhood schools. Easiest way to do that is to cut the budget. Larger class sizes is one of the biggest things that we've seen with the budget cuts. There are fewer teachers, but the same number of students. So teachers, when they once had 150 students, they now have 180. Experienced teachers are being replaced by young, inexperienced teachers who, incidentally, cost less. The district created a performance plan or a pay plan for teachers that has invited experienced teachers to leave because they're expensive. And when your experienced teachers leave the district, are replaced by inexperienced teachers, the quality of your education system is going to go down. The district is no longer providing the funds, so they look to the parents. And fees have increased drastically. Bus fees, they now have to pay to ride the bus. They will pay to park in their parking lots. AP courses and AP uh, exams, they will also pay for textbooks. There are technology fees, classroom fees for using labs, chemistry labs, biology labs. It, it doesn't end. It's no longer a free public education. They created a block schedule with fewer teachers. Teachers cost money. It's 85% of the budget. So what they did is they, they created a situation where students were asked to take fewer courses. In fact, they were demanded to take fewer courses where our students are now part-time students.
My oldest daughter, Caitlin, has been in school for less than two hours this morning, and I'm already picking her up. Aren't you a little cold? If she's not coming home sick, she'll be off school for the next two and a half hours. That schedule is her new normal, an off hour plus her lunch period. What time do you have to be back? Next year, when she's a junior, and then a senior after that, she'll have up to three and a half hours off from her school day. These days, fast food joints and coffee shops do great business during the middle of the school day. Katy Perry visited Lakewood High School after students there won a national contest for school spirit. Lakewood is the flagship of Jefferson County Schools, which is right next door to us in Douglas County. Katy Perry visited the school and performed a private concert for the kids of Lakewood High. In order to win the contest, the entire Lakewood High School student body produced a video project together. This is what a great public school can do when there is real dedication and a public community behind it. To me, it exemplified how great a public school can really be. How quickly things can change. This is Jefferson County Schools just a few months later. Um, I can't leave it in because I'm not trusted or respected by the board of As in Douglas County, a small number of voters voted in a free market majority in a low turnout election. The new majority caused a lot of controversy with many of the same reforms we've seen in Douglas County. I will be gone before the end of the month, and I just want you to know... No! Cindy Stevenson was among the first to be pushed out in a surprise decision. And after an alleged national search for her replacement, Jefferson County's new school board chose Douglas County's second in command. Our assistant superintendent got the job as superintendent in Jeffco. Mr. John Moore has hired a board of behind closed doors. This district is moving in the wrong direction with this decision. I will support it. There's something different in the air here in Jefferson County. A raw energy that we just don't feel in Douglas County. These citizens aren't afraid to stand up against the reformers. And watch this. This is our decision already been made. When Ken Witt, the newly elected reform school board president, is questioned by an opposing school board member, and he refuses to answer the question. This board will make a 10-minute recess. This board will make a 10-minute recess. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! County schools and right next door in Jefferson County schools. Where else? The hostile takeover of public schools is happening almost everywhere. The more I learned, the more questions I had. In order to get those answers, I had to leave Douglas County and see things for myself. So I bought a plane ticket and headed for Chicago. Unlike conservative Douglas County, 
Chicago has a long dynasty of democratic control. It's no secret Chicago is plagued with poverty, and it's reflected in its public schools. Chicago Public Schools graduates only about 69% of its students. When Richard Daley was mayor, he took over Chicago Public Schools in an attempt to turn the schools around. He replaced the school superintendent with the CEO of schools, with the idea of running the school district more like a business. A higher level of accountability and excellence than ever. But Chicago is also a strong union town. More than 32,000 teachers and education professionals are members of the Chicago Teachers Union. Offering our children an outstanding education is one of our most fundamental, perhaps our most fundamental, obligation as a company. Democrats for Education Reform provide much of the horsepower here in Chicago. They're a very well-funded organization that spend a lot of money on elections, advertising, and coordinated efforts to help push reforms. It's this combination of politics and poverty that has created a perfect storm for education reform. It's Sunday night, and while everyone else is watching the Bears on TV, Philip Cantor is grading papers. He's a high school science teacher at one of the poorest schools in the city. He tells me his students face a whole set of problems that the kids in Douglas County will never know. When you're working with really low-income students, the level of out-of-school factors that you have to deal with goes up dramatically. These are students who deal with abuse. They're students who deal with family members who are incarcerated uh, at, at a high level. I mean, it's not one or two students out of, I, I teach 150 students. It's not one or two who have a parent in prison. It's many who have parents in prison. It's not one or two who have witnessed uh, an incident of gun violence directly. It's many of them have witnessed it directly, and all of them have have been touched by it indirectly. Well, there's still vast inequities, unusually high dropout rates for African American and Hispanic students, gaps in test scores. Poverty has a direct correlation. I think there's been study after study um, that really shows that poverty has an impact on your educational outcome. Every kid, no matter where they're, you know, their color, no matter what their socioeconomic background, can go into a classroom and be assured that they will have the opportunity to have a great educational outcome. And the way it is right now in this country, that's not assured. Your job as a teacher is to teach them the content. I still have to teach them DNA replication, but I'm also trying to sort of help them through their life at the time. And unless I can connect with them and help them just know that somebody cares about them and their life, they have no interest in learning about DNA replication. Thank you, Chicago for this humbling victory. All I can say, you sure know how to make a guy feel at home. Rahm Emanuel left his post as President Obama's chief of staff to run for the mayor of Chicago. We have not won anything until a kid can go to the school thinking of their studies and not their safety. Part of his platform was to tackle gang violence, which had become a familiar companion alongside Chicago's poverty problems. So seven dead, 37 injured again this weekend alone. Three dozen shootings last weekend. Many Chicago kids must walk through dangerous gang territory and cross gang lines just to get to school. A cornerstone in Mayor Emanuel's plan was to shutter more than 50 public schools while at the same time allowing privately run charter schools to mushroom. This new generation of charter school has proven to be a safe bet and a boon for charter school companies. If you could buy one thing right now, David, one type of asset in real estate, what would it be? Well, we follow the charter school business. We said is our highest growth, the most appealing segment right now of the portfolio. It's the most high in demand. It's the most recession resistant and great opportunity set with 500 schools starting every year. Uh, it's a two and a half billion dollar opportunity set in rough measure annually. One way that we try to understand things is to look at a map, and when we look at these underutilized schools, we see that they're surrounded by charters that are draining the traditional schools of students. So at the same time we hear about underutilized schools, we also hear talk of building more charters, which sounds about as contradictory as Excuse eliminating me, the... Mr. Bryson, okay. Charter schools are one of those sticky widgets in public education. Some people love them. Others see them as a threat. 
Many parents see them as a step up from public schools because charters often present themselves as a quasi-private alternative, where some students wear uniforms and the schools can have catchy names with words like academy and college prep. Originally, charter schools were alternative public schools started by parent groups who wanted a more direct involvement in their child's education. And for many, that model worked well. But that model has changed over the years. A current trend is charter schools run by private education management organizations, sometimes called EMOs or CMOs. About 40% of the country's 6,000 charter schools are run by these companies, and the trend is growing. As an example, about 80% of Michigan's charter schools are now privately run. Charters have always had a lot of latitude and autonomy in how they run their schools. There is little or no financial oversight from the public tax dollars they receive from us to run the schools. For example, they get to set their own curriculum, their own enrollment criteria, and their own discipline standards. Many charter school teachers are required to be certified and are consequently paid much less than their public school colleagues. And not every kid can attend a charter school. There's evidence that some schools can make it very difficult for students to get in, if they don't fit the mold. A Reuters investigation found at some schools, the enrollment period was only a few hours each year. At this charter school located in a wealthy suburb of Chicago, parents were required to become investors in the school. There were benefits to this investment, including naming rights for the donor who met the $10 million price tag. Charter schools don't have to provide many of the services required by traditional public schools, like, for instance, free and reduced lunch. Most do not provide transportation. And although charter schools are required by law to provide special education, investigations have shown that students with special needs are often discouraged from enrolling and counseled out of charter schools. In Illinois, charter schools even have their own lobby group. Instead of charters being started by teachers and parents in a community, they're being started and funded uh, with public money uh, through these large charter chains that are large business uh, conglomerates. Uh, some are for-profit, some are non-profit, but they all, if you look at their boards of directors, tend to be full of hedge fund managers and investment bankers. Uh, the education market is seen as a tremendous market. Whenever they're challenged in court, before the National Labor Relations Board, they say, we are not a public school, we are not subject to the public laws, uh, we're private corporations that contract with the government. I'm convinced, I've seen this now happen time and again on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and in the Midwest, where, where the charter response to any situation is, we're not public schools. But when they go looking for the money, they're public schools. When Rahm Emanuel returned to Chicago to run for mayor, it was the CEO of UNO. Juan Ron Hell, who walked alongside the streets of Pilsen, questions have surfaced about alleged insider deals to contractors. Federal investigations and FBI raids raise questions about EMOs in Chicago and across the country. Uno had received a $98 million state construction grant, but now the Securities and Exchange Commission is investigating Uno. I would be lying if I said I'm not concerned about um, ensuring quality within the education reform movement. Whenever you have um, uh, something new, something innovative, and, and people are trying to get involved with it. You're going to have folks who get involved who have an opportunistic um, bent to them, whose interests aren't really in the students or the families, um, but how can I make a buck off of this? In Chicago, charter schools proliferate while public schools close. The decision to deal with the 54 schools was not taken lightly, but it was taken with the notion of how do we make sure that every child can get to a quality school with a quality education. The feeling of a loss of local control and identity when politically connected outside companies and groups take over their schools in an attempt to make them better. You already took a job the way. You already took a home the way. Now you want to take out education the way. Today, there was little harmony at Chicago Public School Board meetings. Public school students are left to fend for themselves. You are here under the thumb of Rahm Emanuel. You are here to purposefully settle our education for failure. This country has the money. These corporations have the money. These CEOs have the money. These banks have the money. And it's not fair. It's not fair. And it's not fair.
Charter schools and the whole school choice movement have flourished because of a subtle yet significant change in the language. One short phrase reframes the entire conversation about public school funding, per pupil revenue. It's the foundation for every school choice initiative and a free market catchphrase. Here's what it means. Traditionally, public schools have been funded by need. For example, if a school has a high population of children living below the poverty line, more money might be sent to that school for free and reduced lunches. The same would hold true for schools that need more special education teachers or English as a second language teachers. The kids who need this extra help are simply more expensive to educate. In contrast, the free market approach to school funding is one of simple arithmetic. Per pupil revenue equally divides the overall budget by the number of students in the district. Every student gets the same amount of money regardless of their needs. This also puts the idea into parents' heads that this is their money and they can spend it however they want on their child's education. The money follows the child. When a child leaves a public school for, say, a charter, he depletes that overall public school's budget by taking the money with him. Critics argue the kids who need the most help, the most expensive to educate, are now being left behind in the underfunded public schools. When the state allocates funds, it was never meant to say that it costs the same thing to educate every student. And any money that leaves those schools hurts our children and it hurts the community. I took a plane to the epicenter of American education policies, Washington, D.C. And here's what I learned. No child left behind has been the law of the land since 2002 when George W. Bush signed it into law. In the years since, the law has been criticized because it ties so much success or failure of a school, its teachers, and its students to the results of standardized testing. Publishing companies that support standardized tests and all of the testing materials are among the most profitable in the free market reform movement. Companies like Pearson Publishing and McGraw-Hill Education make billions of dollars every year from contracts with school districts all over the country. Both companies have enjoyed huge growth since No Child Left Behind became law. It's estimated that the testing business alone will top a trillion dollars in the next few years. And we will transform our schools and colleges and universities to meet the demands of the new age. All this we can do. Back in 2009, the newly elected president wanted to make his mark on improving public education. President Obama's Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, who, by the way, used to be the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, administers an education policy that creates a market-friendly environment for testing companies. The big emphasis of Arne Duncan was that the test scores should determine whether a teacher is effective or not effective. So if the scores go up, 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 this is an effective teacher. If the scores are flat or, or go down, then it's the teacher's fault. And this is real high-stakes testing. So we've turned these scores on the test into some kind of sacred icon. This cornerstone of the Obama education policy is called the Common Core. The idea behind Common Core sounds like a good one, giving every student a level playing field of skills when they graduate. But there are strings attached, and many of those strings lead back to the richest man in America, Bill Gates. Gates has been critical of American public schools for several years. He claims public schools and public school teachers are in large part obsolete and ineffective. Gates' view of American education is one where charter schools dominate and compete for their students. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has spent and continues to spend billions of dollars to influence and change American public education. In just two years, the foundation has spent more than $200 million across the country to influence state lawmakers, teachers unions, school districts, and lobby groups to adopt and support Common Core standards. Just two years and $200 million later, 45 states now adopt Common Core. It's a mammoth transformation of American public education. No one can deny all of the good that Bill Gates does with his philanthropy. And the principle of Common Core is a good one. But critics say it's the way Common Core is being implemented that's setting up public education for failure. 
That's because Common Core has to be tested on students. I'm talking about tests. Ew, I don't like tests. You're not the only one, Eddie. But the new tests are just replacing the ones you already take with questions that show us whether you really understand things, like fractions. And it's those standardized test scores that are the linchpin for success or failure. If students perform poorly on standardized tests, then their teachers may get a poor review. It could even cost them their job. If states don't prove they have rigorous education standards, federal money is held back from the public schools in that state. This is what's been called high-stakes testing. The claim is that no child left behind will encourage better teachers and better performing schools. But critics see holes in that law. They see it as putting a stranglehold on public school teachers and their schools. Schools in impoverished areas and students with little family support will likely perform poorly. Their teachers will be poorly evaluated and their schools will not receive the much needed federal funding. When public schools fail and public school teachers are evaluated poorly, then reformers can make a strong case to close that school and do away with its teachers, oftentimes replacing it with a privately run charter school, something Bill Gates wholeheartedly supports. Bottom line is, I start to think about all this data-driven metric that we're locked into right now. It's treating children as if they were identical or heading for a direction of mechanizing education and treating the children as interchangeable parts. While I was in Washington, D.C., I got a tip that Arnie Duncan was speaking at a local elementary school for a press event. So I showed up there, too, with my camera. I was able to meet the Secretary of Education and interview him briefly at the end of the event. I asked him about for-profit interests in public education. Needs a uh, uh, public education system where everyone uh, you know, needs a public education. Well, that's, that's what we're about, is about having great public education. You're seeing that right here in D.C., uh, whether it's traditional uh, schools, uh, whether it's uh, charter schools, it doesn't matter. We just need great public schools, and that's what D.C. is committed to having. Does it care to have business in this be part of public education? Well, I think it's, a, it's an odd question. They, you, know, you have textbook companies, you have buses, you have lunches, you have milk. And so there's always been business and education. The bottom line is how do you make sure every single child has a good education? That's what we're about. You know, if you look at it only as the right wing is doing this, that's interesting. But more importantly, the right wing and the Obama administration are working hand in glove, and that is bizarre. Turning public schools over to private industry takes changing some laws. And these laws aren't being written on Capitol Hill. They're being written a few blocks away by corporate representatives and their state lawmaker partners. Members of the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, have been quietly rewriting education policy for business interests state by state. And they've been doing it for decades. ALEC is a group of public and private sector people who come together to discuss um, political issues and, um, across the country. I'm just a bill, yes I'm only a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey. Tough break, Billy Boy, but there's a new way to make laws these days. Alex the name, and you better not scratch the limo, pal. See, it works like this nowadays. A bunch of corporations get together and get tax write-offs for bankrolling a, a charity called the American Legislative Exchange Council. Sounds pretty official, huh? It might not surprise you to discover that well-funded education reforms are a national effort led by some of the biggest players in for-profit education. So now there's suddenly one big happy family, the corporations, the lobbyists, the politicians. And so without lobbyists, where would we get our information? Um, I value the work of lobbyists. I'm not, I've never been a critic of, of the lobbying industry. Uh, because, boy, without them giving us information about the legislation, uh, both sides were for and against. How would we make decisions? When Nancy Spence was decisions. in the Colorado Senate, she gained a reputation for pushing education reform bills through the state. It was because of those bills that ALEC leadership asked Senator Spence to chair their education task force. 
Well, I loved it. And the reason I loved it is because I had a great deal of influence, particularly when I chaired the task force, on the direction that uh, ALEC would take uh, on education issues nationwide. Here's how ALEC works. Behind closed doors, corporate members meet with state lawmakers. Together, they write model free market legislation that lawmakers from every state can take back and introduce as their own bills. Corporations get to co-write your laws. Under the Education Task Force banner, Alex's website lists more than 45 pieces of current model legislation. I chaired the task force with a woman from the private sector uh, who was actually an, an, an executive with Connections Academy in New York. So the two of us, private sector, public sector, chaired the task force. Connections Academy, a corporate member of ALEC, is owned by Pearson Publishing. It's part of a rapidly growing industry of online schools. Online schools make money by replicating a standardized internet curriculum, selling it over and over again, and collecting a majority of per pupil revenue for every student who signs up. It's a very profitable model. Are you coming down for lunch? There's a place where kids really connect to learning. You getting hungry? Connections Academy. It's a tuition-free online. One of the bills that, that Alec created, at the time when the corporate chair of the committee was an executive with a for-profit online vendor. And in fact, two of the corporate members were both from two different companies that were for-profit online um, education vendors. What they created was this model legislation, the model virtual education bill, that would allow a state to create or to create charter schools that were had no bricks and mortar, that were all online. That legislation says that a uh, virtual school, meaning online education at your house, uh, is paid the same amount per pupil as a school that has bricks and mortar and lunch ladies and uh, athletic teams, student councils, uh, heating, lighting, uh, air conditioning, uh, the same amount per pupil as a school that provides all of those services. And the difference is profit. The Tennessee members of the uh, task force brought that bill back to Tennessee. It was enacted nearly verbatim. Um, they did remember to put Tennessee in there, but it, it nearly verbatim. Within months, there was a no-bid contract from one of the school districts hiring the very corporation that helped to write the bill. When you look at K-12, one of the things you see is that this is a, an entity that was um, spawned in part by Wall Street traders in the first place. Is your child happy in school? Is the pace too fast or too slow? Does your child need a more flexible or individualized approach? You do have another choice. Online learning from K-12. That money comes out of our public schools and goes in the hands of a Wall Street traded firm who's not accountable to you, whose investors may be in the U.S. or abroad, who, whose bottom line is the bottom line and not necessarily whether your students, your kids perform well or not, uh, and they're paid handsomely out of your tax dollars. So when I looked at K-12, one of the companies that has been part of Alec, they're paying their CEO, K-12 is paying its CEO nearly a half a million dollars a year in salary and he's received nearly $20 million in stock. Uh, that's almost all at public expense. As it turns out, Alex Reach also comes very close to home. Cindy Barner discovered that there's a lot of Alec influence stitched into Douglas County's reforms. The outside influences that had brought the Douglas County Choice Scholarship Program or a voucher program into Douglas County are numerous. The Independence Institute, which is a conservative think tank and ALEC member, helped to design the Douglas County Voucher Program. ALEC alumni, Cinnamon Watson, was a top-level school administrator. And during many of these reforms, Cinnamon Watson ran the communications department at Douglas County Schools. But long before her time at Douglas County, Cinnamon Watson worked for ALEC and co-wrote ALEC's guidebook on education reform. Well, I'm here to remind you and thank you um, for allowing politics to be part of what we do in this district. Chris Holbert, a state lawmaker, he is a member of ALEC. Perhaps the most telling evidence lies in the language of Douglas County's own Choice Scholarship Voucher Program. The language is verbatim. The end game um, with ALEC's agenda, and their agenda is quite clear 
on education. They want to privatize and they want to dismantle our public schools. Now, I was never a conspiracy theorist about public education until, until I started doing my work on ALEC. And I'm in the Wizard of Oz and somebody pulled that curtain on my head and I'm going, really? I'm, really? <laughs> public education may be up for sale around the country, but not everywhere. I did find some examples where public education was working great. Here's just one example. My premise is that learning doesn't take place unless there's interest behind it. Interest drives everything. You hook on to a student's interest, they'll go anyplace. You'll be surprised where they can go with that. Just across the river from New York City, Hudson County Schools of Technology is part of the public school system here. But they're far from traditional. A lot of that has to do with this man. And in my school district, we pride ourselves in a culture that really wraps around every kid. This is Frank Gargiulo the superintendent of Hudson County Schools of Technology. Frank is well aware of the pressures that surround public education, and he's developed some pretty strong opinions about what's going on. The scores and numbers and grades are the absolute detriment to American education in the 21st century, because American education requires creativity. It doesn't require a score. This whole idea of standardizing, this whole idea of making people standard, there's no such thing as a standard person. I never met this. I never met me any place. You know what I mean? It's just that doesn't exist. And so what we continually try to do is take the kind of a round kid and stick him in a square hole and shove him in the best we can and push down the sides and get him in there or hurry him there. It just doesn't work. Frank Gargiulo has taken his schools down an unorthodox path, which shields his teachers and his students from many of the reform pressures. You know, one of the chemistry teachers there who teaches all the chemistry courses, I, I've convinced him that no grades. Your job is to get them excited about it. They assign the grade. I want to get a form of shade. He told me they're doing more than they have ever done. You look at it that way, it's much easier to explain the different energies in the shells. In the 21st century, you need to teach children how to learn, not what to learn. What to learn is the interest piece. Through that vehicle, you need to learn everything you need to survive and flourish and flourish and be successful. I believe in a country where every kid has an equal shot at being something. And that notion that we have that we need to have winners and losers is tough on kids. Very often uh, corporations and people who have a lot of money believe because they have a lot of money they got smart. You know what I mean? And, the, and I don't know if they're smart or not smart, but they have a lot of money. And, and very often they come in and try to dominate a school district. Education is not the, a business model. It's just not. It's a different thing, but you're dealing with, with the, the brain. has been said about failing public schools. Some inner city schools like this one have been called dropout factories. I traveled to the Boyle Heights neighborhood in East Los Angeles to see for myself. After school, these kids were walking by and agreed to talk for a few minutes. Well, I didn't hear any information. The main reason that the school is known as a dropout factory, maybe because the, most of the students here, like, they don't get sent to other schools. Like, Roosevelt is the one that accepts everyone, whether you're a failure, you're homeless, you're pregnant, because every other school rejects him. And that's why, because all the other schools reject him, their test scores all been so great. But our schools accept him. We try to help them. Our school helps us. You'd be surprised how committed the teachers are. Like, I know a teacher, he's my calculus teacher. He stays after school, like, three times a day. He doesn't get paid for that. He even has a family, but he's just like, you know what, I'm going to give an extra hour if kids need help. Like, oh, I respect that. When we go to school, we can't give it a chance. But if we shut down public schools, they're pretty much not even giving us a chance anymore. They're not giving us a chance anymore. Think about the, the kids that are actually trying. Are you going to like shut it down just because of a couple of failures? Me, I want to be the journalist. I want to go to USC and all that, and my grade is 4.14. I want to be a psychiatrist. Well, I want to become a mechanical engineer. The, the reason I want to become a mechanical engineer is because I love inventing new stuff. What are you doing now at school? Well, we're going to go volunteer to help the little kids in their reading and their literature. First, it's elementary school.
listen to this. Nearly 80% of New York City high school graduates have trouble. American public education sure does have its critics. They compare us to other countries who rank much higher than we do. Like, for example, Finland. And they do have a point. Finland is the highest ranked country in the world by any education standard. But think about this. Finland is not America. Essentially, it's a socialist democracy where everyone pays a lot more in taxes than we do. And teachers, they're among the most respected in Finnish society, up there with doctors and lawyers. Finland does not impose high-stakes standardized testing on its students. And Finland has a population about the size of Boston, where mostly everyone comes from the same ethnic background. We're a melting pot of cultures and extremely different political views. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. More than 50 years ago, President Lyndon Johnson did a lot to attack poverty head-on in the United States. But in the last half century since then, we've not only stood still, but slipped backwards. Crisis after crisis, when we have social failure, the finger pointing begins and it's always pointed at the public schools. The, the whole discussion of school reform has become a massive distraction from the real issues. The real issues in our society are, number one, we have the highest proportion of kids living in poverty of any of the advanced nations of the world, and it is getting worse. We're seeing the most dramatic income inequality in our history. Uh, and a growing number of kids in poverty at the same time that a very tiny, tiny elite is living uh, in unbelievable splendor. We're, we're like, we, we, it's as though we've slid back to the age of the robber barons or the Gilded Age when people like Bill Gates and Michelle Rhee, for example, have said, uh, if we fix the schools first, then we can turn to poverty. That's ridiculous. Overall, results of school choice free market reforms are mixed at best. The National Education Policy Center, an academic research organization and part of the University of Colorado, released a report on online schools. The study shows that online students lag far behind their public school counterparts. A study on charter schools by Stanford University's Center for Research on Education Outcomes shows that while some charter schools perform better, many more perform about the same or slightly worse than public schools. The education research book, The Public School Advantage, shows that when private and public school students are compared side by side from similar economic backgrounds, public school students slightly outperform students from private schools. There are plenty of reports with strong claims that reforms are working, but that research is overwhelmingly paid for by reform supporters. What we do know from very good, strong research, uh, robust research over and over again, that what it takes to succeed is to have a highly trained teacher with a rigorous curri curriculum and sufficient resources to implement it. That's not as sexy as saying school choice. It's not as easy. It's much more complicated and really, really messy, but that's what works. And that's where we ought to be focusing our energies on making sure that every kid has that available to them. First of all, schools need to be more influenced by the educators instead of the politicians. We have a problem with that right now. The political spectrum is driving the schools. The educational spectrum is not. And that's a real problem. Probably the number one problem in the country today. The educators have to get back into the school. Then there has to be an open dialogue. I believe the test should be made not by Pearson and McGraw-Hill. A uh, test should be made by teachers. Opt out of the test. Don't take them. Keep your kids home. I've been all over the country, and I've learned a lot more than I ever expected about how public schools work. They're such amazing learners. I started asking questions because I wanted to know what was going on in my daughter's schools. So now it's time to head home. There's a big election around the corner in my hometown. <laughs> Over the next several months, the citizens of Douglas County will come together like they never have before.
free market reformers have their own strategy. I don't understand the science. Can you explain the science to me? These costume Grinches wouldn't show their faces in public, but it turns out they were paid protesters from a mysterious outside money source. And then there's AM radio. The free market reformers have a friend and conservative talk show host, Mike Rosen. But you're up against what I call uh, women, mostly women, who have a, a terminal protracted case of teacher's pet syndrome. These are, are nice, well-meaning, naive soccer moms. A lot will, will depend on your ability to get through to these well-intentioned but politically naive soccer moms about how, how high the stakes are here. Now, these soccer moms are mad as hell. And they're not going anywhere. They've taken over sidewalks and intersections in every corner of the county. Douglas County Schools, the best in Colorado. So why are our schools under attack? There's a power struggle over our schools. While the naive soccer moms take over the streets, the free market reformers take over the airwaves. The country's falling behind because our schools aren't keeping up. With an expensive primetime ad buy, which includes Sunday Bronco games. In a little over a month, they'll spend about $350,000 on television commercials alone. All for a local school board race. I think it's naive to say that politics is not going to be part of what goes on in in the public education. But deal with it. <laughs> and now, the top brass in the school district have gotten into the money race. Superintendent Fagan brought in Rick Hess of the conservative American Enterprise Institute to observe and report on the district's reforms. He wrote an article called The Most Interesting School District in America. The article was publicized by the district as an outside, objective, third-party review. But in fact, the district and its nonprofit arm paid Hess to write the article. The most interesting school district in America was published, printed, and then mass-mailed to voters all over Douglas County. William Bennett, the former Secretary of Education under Ronald Reagan, who helped foster a nation at risk, and is one of the founders of the K-12 Online Academy, was also added to the district's roster for paid opinions. <laughs> Bennett wrote and published his own paper, supporting the district and its reforms. He followed up with a live appearance and a speech in Douglas County just before the election. Both his paper and his appearance were paid for by the district's nonprofit arm. And on the other side, the teachers' union has now jumped into the ring. They've dropped almost a quarter of a million dollars to fight back against the reformers. Without much of a budget, an army of citizen volunteers has been going door to door to get the vote out. Good afternoon, how are you? We're good, how good. are you? I'm good, I'm sorry about that. My name is Brian. I'm not walking today. Brian White is looking to break an all-time endurance record. This school board race is being watched by people around the country. Um, they poured in tons of money from, from outside the school district. The other four are outside the district.
keep saying that they're not going to come into school tomorrow. Um, and they're just so sad that the community has spoken like this. So we're just sad for our teachers right now. That's why we all got involved in this. Going into election night, I thought that, you know, there was, it could have gone either way. The election could be considered a failure because we didn't win the election, but we almost won against some massive amounts of money coming in from outside the county. I think I've come to realize that it's more of a marathon than it is a sprint. It's going to take some time. Today, the Douglas County School Board moves ahead. And now it has capped the number of people who can attend board meetings, leaving many citizens stuck out in the hallway. But this fight is far from over. Right next door in Jefferson County, the citizens have taken their cue from us, and they've doubled down on their efforts to push back. We need to be out and be spoken and heard. Right now, we've got the national spotlight. People, they've, they've all turned out to support their schools, um, support their kids. Teachers are standing up against what's going on in Jefferson County. They're walking out of schools, and, and that draws national attention. Since Friday, over a thousand Jefferson County students from 15 schools have taken part in walkouts. We believe that this issue is so important that it needed to be brought to the streets. As a result, their board has halted and even backtracked on many of their reform plans. Well, they're taking actions that cause people to be aware of what's going on. It, it makes them aware of what's happening. They start asking questions, and, and that's what we want is people to ask questions. Wait, this, this, is this, is the, this is the teacher union-based walkout. That is just not true, sir. You don't even know what the eight push is are about. We weren't quite aggressive enough, in my opinion, to, to put an end to this, and, and they're being much more aggressive. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they learned from the mistakes that we made in Douglas County. And we're a community that likes to stand up for what we believe in. I think civil disobedience is part of our, our culture, part of our history, and part of what has made this country outstanding, part of what's made this country what it is. You know, I really believe that even in Douglas County, the, the tide is beginning to turn. Um, people are beginning to take notice of what's going on. It's just taken a little longer, I think, partly because we didn't take as many aggressive actions as we should have. Teachers that are willing to take aggressive action, students that are willing to take aggressive action, it's all about standing up for what's right. And, and I think that's what it's going to take. years from now, teachers um, will be on the right side of history, and I believe that the history books will, will talk about how teachers and students and informed community members stood up to, to big money interests and actually saved public education in this country, which in my opinion is, is critical to continuing our republic um, and continuing democracy in this country. It's over.